The night seemed especially dark when I opened my eyes at 2 a.m. Something felt eerie, but I slipped those emotions aside as I slid out from under the covers and made my way to the kitchen for a drink of water. Was it a sound, a smell, a feeling that made me alter course and make a left turn into the office? Probably none of them. But slowly, my vision made out something odd, something alien. As I focused through my sleepy mind, I suddenly became more awake. There, on the floor in front of me, something glowed. Luminescent stripes. The thing was about two inches long, unlike anything I ever expected to see in my house. Turned out, it was something carnivorous. Something that only comes out at night. Something useful? Welcome to STEM Punks. Welcome to STEM Punks. STEM Punks is a bi-monthly podcast intended to bring science, technology, engineering, engineering, straight to your ears from our STEM Punk studio. Hang on, we'll take you for a ride that includes a whole lot of fun and a little bit of education on the side. Stay tuned. Nice to be in orbit. <laughs> Welcome to the STEM Punks podcast. My name is Joe Garut, and I will be your host. And with me, as always, is my buddy, Stembot. Hello, Stembot. Hello, Joe. You know, Stembot, that story didn't happen quite like that, but I did see a glowing object in the office when I went in to do something one evening, and it turned out that that glowing object was alive. I was visited that night by a glowworm beetle, most likely Fengodes plumosa, unless it was a Fengodes fusicep. Gesundheit. <laughs> Thanks, Stembot. Glowworm beetles' typical habitat is listed as marshes, lawns, and fields, damp soil with some leaf litter, and dirt beneath decaying logs. So what was it doing in my house? Well, the short answer is it may have just been on its way somewhere else. Of course, it may have been given an unintentional ride in with some chunk of outside soil. Now, we keep a pretty clean house and take off our shoes at the door, so I doubt it was the latter, but... I have a fair amount of millipedes around, and the glowworm beetles are carnivorous. Actually, they're omnivorous because they eat both meat and plants. That glowworm beetle quite likely was hunting. Glowworm beetles are useful because they eat millipedes and other arthropods, and boy, have I seen a lot of those around lately. The millipedes, I mean, not other arthropods like crabs and the like. It's probably an instance where size really does matter. I'm pretty sure crabs are not glowworm beetle food. However, they will eat slugs and snails. Millipedes are generally harmless to humans, although some can become household or garden pests. And I can tell you what, there is somebody in this house who definitely doesn't like millipedes. Millipedes can be unwanted, especially in greenhouses where they can cause severe damage to emergent seedlings. They mostly eat decaying leaves and other dead plant matter, but sometimes those tender seedlings are a little too hard to resist. Some eat fungi. Well, if they eat the fungi, how will you stay happy? Oh, Stembot, that's just bad. <laughs> what I don't like about millipedes is that where there is one, there are usually hundreds. It's just a nuisance. Let's get back to our glowworm beetles. The winged males also have bioluminescence, and it's hard to say why exactly that they glow. There are a number of things that it could be, not the least of which is to let predators know that they are not tasty to eat. In fact, the real star of the show, the female, has multiple bands down her side to let predators know to stay away. She utilizes that talent in raising her young. She deposits her eggs on the surface of the ground and then curls her body around to protect them with her segmented ring of light to let others know that it's not a good place to find a meal. You know, interestingly enough, the female glowworm beetle actually attracts the male not with light, but with pheromones. Bioluminescence is used for many, many things. Sometimes it's used for defense, and it's activated by touch, which surprises the predator enough to scare them away. 
Some species of jellyfish utilize this defense mechanism. Bioluminescence can also create a higher visibility, which actually functions as a sort of communication between some species. Again, in some jellyfish, the illumination stakes out their territory, so other feeding jellyfish stay in their own area. As many of you know, the anglerfish has a bioluminescent appendage that lures in prey deep in the ocean depths. And back to glowworms for just a second. One species in Australia has larvae that coats the ceiling of a cave half a mile below the surface with sticky, silk-like strands that hang down. The light they emit in the pure darkness lures moths into their doom, and the larvae gobble them up. Bioluminescence isn't limited to just moving creatures either. There are over 70 species of fungi. There's that fungi again. Yes, Tembot, I know. Funny once, funny a thousand times. Anyway, there are over 70 species of fungi. Don't say it that have bioluminescent qualities. There are lots of luminescent paths we could go down that are pretty cool, and we'll do that here in just a second. But before we do, let me tell you just a little bit about how bioluminescence works. A light-emitting protein present called luciferin typically reacts with oxygen in the presence of an enzyme called luciferase, along with other agents. When this happens, chemical energy is converted to light energy. One thing of note is that in contrast to fire and electrically generated light, bioluminescence is cold light, which means that the reactions that create this light waste very little energy as heat, and since a living organism is producing it, that is very important to their survival. Now here are a few ways that bioluminescence is being tested and utilized through STEM. In the food industry, they have found that the addition of oxygen and an aqueous solution, which really translates to your spit, adding those to food containing bioluminescent proteins starts a photon-releasing reaction, which makes a lollipop light up. Depending upon the concentration, the light show can last anywhere from several seconds between licks to several minutes. A really interesting application for bioluminescence is to replace street lights, lit up road signs, and even interior lighting by splicing genes from bioluminescent firefly and marine bacteria into trees. Can you imagine a roadside of glowing trees to light your way home? I know, I know, we're not used to it, but it might be kind of cool. In a further implementation of some creative thinking, scientists have created a potato that glows when it is dehydrated. Yep, it will let you know when to water. That might be nice, huh? They can engineer it for different colors, too. Glowing red? Water it. Glowing yellow? You better be thinking about it. Glowing green? Eh, you're good to go. Of course, concerns over genetically modifying plants has kept drought-indicating potatoes and street lamp trees off the market for now. Another cool application is luminescent marine bacterium that assesses water quality. The bacteria's glow diminishes when certain chemicals, such as heavy metals and pesticides, disrupt its light-making process. This could be added to water samples or monitoring areas to assess drinking or irrigation water. Bioluminescent mushrooms could soon provide a similar signal. Like that marine bacteria, their light fades in the presence of toxicants. However, some researchers have modified microorganisms so that their glow brightens rather than dims when toxins are present. Now, that makes sense because it is easier to detect an increase of light compared to a decrease. They have demonstrated that this technique in bacteria will react to arsenic, a common water contaminant, and oil hydrocarbons. There are even more ways that bioluminescence can be utilized by imaginative and diligent scientists. But before I go, I'd like to finish up briefly with a cool STEM mention of another biotopic that caught my eye, bionics. Now, how does this tie in? Well, I read an announcement the other day about a researcher Ritu Raman, who has developed inchworm-sized robots made partly of biological tissue and muscle. See the tie-in? Glowworm and inchworm? <laughs> she has effectively created what could be called a bionic inchworm. Dr. Raman has built 3D printers capable of patterning living cells and proteins. 
She puts those into a mold where the cells self-assemble into dense muscle tissue. The tissue is then transferred to a robotic skeleton. The robots, powered by living skeletal muscle, move in response to light or electricity. Now, through these inchworms, for lack of a better analogy, she is exploring the possibility of making biohybrid implants for drug delivery that adapt to the body better than purely synthetic implants could. She also postulates that she could build robots to release into a polluted water supply and have them move toward a toxin and exude a chemical to neutralize it. I mean, wow, it's a little weird, but at the same time, very interesting. I'll be interested to see what Dr. Ritu Raman does next. Well, that's it for today's episode. It's time to say goodbye, Stembot. Joe, do you think there will be a time when I can become a biohybrid robot so that I can go explore the world with you? You never know. I would process those experiences with something I would define as joy, Joe. <laughs> Me too, Stembot. Me too. Thank you for listening to the Stempunks podcast. Many thanks to our sponsor, Cottywample Creative. You can see their work at cottywamplecreative.com. That's C O D D I W O M P L E creative.com. And thanks to our patrons on Patreon. You can find information about this episode and more at stempunks.com. Say goodbye, Stembot. Goodbye, Stembot.